welcome Renee to her dissertation defense and all of you. I'm so glad you're here to participate with all of us. Um, I'm Renee Chair, I'm an EWP faculty member, and Danielle Delorier is the uh, <coughs> is a committee member. Um, and Danielle used to be with East West Psychology with us. I'm so glad that he's with us as he takes care of a lot of the narrative and qualitative research he's seen for us now. He used to be part of East West Psychology for so many years. So, and our chair for many, many years. So thank you, Danielle. Yeah, for joining us. And uh, Kristen, who has is not here at the moment, hopefully she'll be calling in later. Let me tell you a little bit about her. Um, Kristen got her PhD in 1997 from the University of California at Berkeley. She's now a tenured professor uh, in the Human Development and Culture Program Edu Educational Psychology Department at the University of Texas, Austin. Mm -hmm. During Kristen's last year of graduate school, she became interested in Buddhism and has been practicing meditation in the insight meditation tradition ever since. She is now a leading researcher uh, studying self-compassion, a central construct in Buddhist psychology. She was the first person to define self-compassion from an academic perspective and has conducted dozens of studies on the mental health benefits of being self-compassionate. In addition to her pioneer, pioneering research into self-compassion, she has developed an eight-week program to teach self-compassion skills. The program co-created with her college <coughs> colleague, Chris Germer, at Harvard University, is called Mindful Self-Compassion. Mm. You can see why she's uh, Renee's external leader. spend some time dialoguing, asking questions, and just getting more information, especially the things that we find most interesting and provocative in her work. And then, uh, time permitting, all of you will be asked to join in some conversation and dialogue with you. So that's the, we have about two hours. So then I'm going to turn this over to you. Okay. Thank you, everyone. I'm uh, very grateful to be here. And uh, as I begin, I also I would like to thank the many people um, who helped me get here. This has been a, a long journey. And um, I would like to start by just taking a moment of silence so that we can all center ourselves with our eyes closed. And at the end of that uh, minute of silence, I'll bring us out by sharing a poem that I have written. So, 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 I will tell you a few very good things that I know. Your life can be easy, your life can be sweet, and you, if you give this a try, you just might want to tweet about the places you'll go and the things that you'll do. When you settle down now, deep inside, oh, it's true. There's a space in there deep where you've hidden before without even knowing. 
you can open the door. And you found long ago, you had buried away, the treasure, the gift, the game you can play, to release, to discover, to find in your mind that all you must do is simply be kind. And all becomes possible as your fears melt away in the here and the now, long after today. So my topic is lasting weight loss and, oh dear, it's kind of going off the screen. That's not so good. How can we help you? Just the way it is, huh? Mm. Let's see what happens with the next <coughs> slide. <coughs> Probably next one. Mm -hmm. It's okay. Well, I guess good. we'll just go with it. So this is our agenda, and I'd like to start with, by sharing with you my story um, and a little bit about inside out weight loss. Hi, I'm Renee. I'm a compulsive overeater, or should I say, a former compulsive overeater. I have eaten from the trash can. I have eaten food from the freezer that was supposed to be defrosted before it was defrosted. I have eaten large amounts of food, and I've also been on 750 calorie a day diets for months at a time. I was once on a 330 calorie a day pro liquid protein fast. It was eventually pulled from the market when people started dropping dead while on it. <laughs> um, and most importantly, I've hated myself fat and I've hated myself thin. Eventually, I found my way, um, well actually, it's, um, it all started when I was 11 years old. And my best friend and I decided to go on a diet because, never mind, neither of us was overweight at the time. Our mothers were always on diets, so we figured that's what women did. They went on diets. And that, for me, started a long journey of yo-yo dieting, going on these crazy diets, gaining and losing weight, and my whole world revolving around what will I eat, what, what, what did I eat, what should I eat, am I gaining weight, am I losing weight, will I look okay, do these genes make me look fat, and so on and so forth. On, an, on Just this ongoing dialogue in my mind. Frankly, it's a miracle I got anything done. Eventually, I found my way to Overeaters Anonymous, which is a 12-step program based on the principles of Alcoholics Anonymous. And there I became abstinent from white flour and sugar. I weighed and measured everything I ate for three years, um, and I actually lost the weight. Unfortunately, though, I still, I was then thin and depressed, and I was left with the obsession. I still was obsessed with my body, my body image, and still had that endless dialogue going on in my mind um, about equ equating my self-worth with my weight. Um, by the time I was 34, I had a health and career crisis that caused me to quit my well-paying job at IBM and pursue what really interested me, which has long been human motivation. And so I started studying something called neuro-linguistic programming in the beginning, which is a set of tools and techniques to create rapid psychological change. I started applying these tools and techniques to my own struggle. So for example, I'd get up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom, completely dark, no one can see me, and I'd reflexively put my hands over my belly to hide the little pooch that it had. This kind of behavior started dropping away, and partway through my first training, I had an epiphany. I realized that I had discovered my life's work. I have since founded a coaching practice. I have uh, created my podcast, Inside Out Weight Loss, and written my book, Fulfilled. That I started my practice about uh, 14 years ago. Welcome to Inside Out Weight Loss. I'm your host, Renee Stevens, and together we are accessing and adjusting the control panel of your mind-body-spirit system. 
bringing ease and joy to your weight loss journey and fullness to the rest of your life. So that's a sample of the Inside Out Weight Loss Podcast. I created Inside Out Weight Loss in 2007. At the time, my coaching practice was very small, and I thought it would be a good way to drum up some business. I thought, I'll give out a little bit of teaser information, and then people will come to me and pay me for more. But as I was sitting down to plan my first episodes, I thought, well, what if I just give it all away? What if I just give away my entire program? And there wasn't a lot of logic behind it. It was just a thought. Um, but that's what I decided to do. Since it was going to be just me speaking every episode, I thought, well, I better keep it interesting, uh, or otherwise people fall asleep and they won't listen. <laughs> so I thought I would weave in some advanced techniques from neurolinguistic programming, emotional freedom technique, hypnosis, and some techniques that I created uh, on my own as well. As a result, each episode became something of a guided journey in and of itself, or often multiple mini guided journeys all built around a particular theme or transformational topic. The each podcast then became both a delivery mechanism for the content of the program, but also a transformative experience in and of itself. To my great surprise, um, this was launched in 2007, and very shortly after launch, it became the number one weight loss podcast on iTunes with uh, approximately 4 million uh, downloads to date. Um, it had stayed the number one podcast on iTunes, weight loss podcast, until I stopped making new episodes to complete my PhD. <laughs> Otherwise, what have happened? Um, and today, there are over 200, uh, approximately 200 episodes available for free. The Inside Out Weight Loss Program, which is also presented in my book, Fulfilled, um, I'll start by telling you what it's not. It is not a series of dieting tips and tricks and techniques, it is, nor is it any kind of exercise program. What it is is a psycho-spiritual approach that walks listeners through a program to address the root causes of their overeating so that they can change those causes and therefore change their relationship with food and exercise. The podcast asserts that each one of us was born naturally slender. So we, as naturally slender babies, we eat when we're hungry, we stop when we're satisfied, we pay attention to our bodies, but somewhere along the way, we get lost. And so the podcast further asserts that anyone can re-become naturally slender by relearning the techniques. It doesn't matter if your mother's fat and your father's fat and your dog is fat. It doesn't matter. You too can become naturally slender again, according to the podcast. So now let's take a look at the design of the study. <coughs> The research that I'm sharing with you today <clears throat> involved interviewing six participants and soliciting their stories of success. Each person has li had listened to Inside Out Weight Loss, credits their success to the podcast, and had maintained their weight loss for at least six months. Um, I focused on stories of success because while failure, unfortunately, is common in weight loss, Success is not. So as the designer of the um, uh, Inside Out Weight Loss Program, I was also interested to hear what were their stories? What was their experience? I'm very aware of what my intention was in creating the podcast, of course, and in creating the program, but I didn't really have a view into what their lived experience of going through the, the program was. So that's what I wanted to capture. I chose narrative methodology um, of eliciting their stories so that I could cast a wide net and include as much as their filters saw to include in the research. I use semi-structured interviews, beginning each interview with the question, tell me your weight loss story. For some, the answer to that was five minutes. For others, it was an hour and five minutes. So <laughs> I then prompted with additional questions as necessary. 
I do want to make it clear that it's all Danielle's fault that I'm doing this. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take the blame. <laughs> 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 um, when I was in my first research colloquium that Danielle led, I came up with three ideas for potential research topics. Two of them were what I thought that I should do. And the third was this topic. And I thought, well, this topic, of course, would be thrown out right away because it's way too self-serving. Plus, it would be fun and interesting to do. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, <laughs> so I went up to Danielle after class, and I said, um, I said, you know, Danielle, what you don't really understand is that the, if I study my program, I, my program isn't actually based on anything respectable or authoritative. I actually just made it up myself secretly. <laughs> and Dan Danielle looked at me, and in that sort of calm and thoughtful way that he has, he said, you know, Renee, it's not that you can study what's in your heart and what you want to study. It's that you must. Hmm. That makes me emotional every time I think about it. But so. Here I am today. <laughs> I think we all know that the weight struggle is of epidemic proportions, not just in this country, but sadly increasingly around the world. And few effective long-term solutions exist. In other words, there are plenty of programs that work in the short term, but program after program in the research shows that as time goes on, people gain the weight back again and again. And when I look at the academic and scientific disciplines that address weight issues, I see the medical community, which focuses on, which is interested in weight issues when disease is present, such as obesity, heart disease, type 2 diabetes, and their interventions tend to focus around pharmaceuticals and surgery, the two main tools at their disposal. The psychological community becomes interested when psychopathology is present. So eating disorders, anorexia, bulimia, and their interventions tend to um, involve uh, uh, addressing the symptoms. But they aren't particularly interested in the physical manifestation or the subclinical struggle of weight, of, of weight issues. The nutritional community, <coughs> of course, approaches weight loss from the aspect of what should you eat to be slim. And the physical fitness and kinesiology communities approach it from the aspect of, well, what exercise should you be doing to be slim and healthy? And finally, the, the spiritual and religious communities aren't particularly concerned with weight issues because they're all about transcending the physical. But when I look at the nature of the weight struggle itself, what I see is a struggle that has aspects, that has medical, physical, spiritual, psychological, and uh, I think I said physical aspects. So here we have an interdisciplinary, or shall we say perhaps a transdisciplinary issue that is getting um, very siloed uh, approaches or solutions. So I see a gap, a gap where there are solutions that focus on these particular areas, but there are very few truly interdisciplinary, integrative, or transdisciplinary approaches. And so I wanted to study an approach of that nature, which in fact is the Inside Out Weight Loss Program. Um, briefly, the methodology, I conducted telephone interviews, I analyzed each story using two filters, inside out aspects of the Inside Out Weight Loss Program that seemed particularly important, hey, it works. Um, <laughs> and aspects of self-compassion. Um, I then, once I had uh, taken all of the stories of my participants and analyzed them, I became very curious to know, well, was there anything in common between all of these people? Any factors that w were true for everybody? And because I thought that might be particularly revealing or important. So I did a common factor analysis, and then the results of that, I, um, I applied some theoretical frameworks from others and my own to see if that would lend any further insights. I'd like to introduce you to a former client of mine. <laughs> Sorry, that's a joke. Um, 
Um, this uh, research, of course, it's a very small study of limited scope. It is subjective by nature, and it only focuses on success. Therefore, it is not comparative. Um, nevertheless, I'm hoping that it offers insights and seeds for further research. The overarching intent of this research um, is to uh, proliferate, proliferate effective solutions, long-term solutions to the weight struggle. Now I'd like to introduce you to my six participants. Sorry, all the photos are getting cut mm -hmm. off. I don't know what to do about that. Anyway, um, so this is Ellen. Ellen is a currently a 25-year-old medical student whose weight struggle began when she was quite young. She, it, um, when she was seven years old, she actually began running, and by the age of eight, she was running competitively. Ellen defines herself as a competitive athlete. And also when she was eight years old, she was in the school playground, and one of her classmates said to her, oh, what size pants do you wear? As only an eight-year-old can get away with saying. And, and Ellen said, oh, I wear a size such and such slim. To this, her classmate responded, you can fit into a slim. Well, Ellen, poor little Ellen was just mortified. Mm -hmm. And it was, that was the moment that she began questioning herself and her weight. As she continued as a competitive runner, her father was her coach, and he would put increasing pressure on her to slim down for her races. Um, she therefore put increasing pressure on herself to maintain her weight, and eventually, by the time, and she started gaining weight and struggling with her weight, by the time she went to her first year of university, which was on a running scholarship, her coach actually redshirted her or prevented her from competing the entire season because of her weight, even though she was one of the 10 fastest runners on the team. For Ellen, she had come to equate her entire self-worth with her weight. She even developed bulimia for a time. Through Inside Out Weight Loss, Ellen came to understand that she was more than a number, in fact, and a huge part of her recovery was forgiving those who had hurt her namely the classmate, her father, and her coach, who had redshirted her. She lost 25 pounds total and um, has maintained that weight loss for over two years so far. She was even able to compete for the Olympic trials for the London Olympics in race walking. That's a picture for there. <coughs> this is John. John is a 47-year-old British man who works as a publishing executive. And as you can see here, John's problem, struggle with weight began as a young child where um, he was overweight. And for him, he was always, as he got older, trying to restrict himself and control his diet, going on countless diets like so many of us. Um, John, the other thing interesting to know about John is that he is, in fact, a, an immensely creative person. And um, in his spare time, he would write, and he wrote, 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 so that he ended up having three finished novels sitting on a shelf at his house that he was convinced would be rejected if he ever sent them off to a publisher, really fantastical, um, uh, tremendous fantasy novels. And he wrote these novels in his home. Now, his home isn't your average home. He lives in a, a townhouse, an average-looking townhouse in the outskirts of London. But inside, he's created, transformed the rooms into these fantastical spaces. He named the house Taliston, which in Old English means the hiding place. <laughs> and he said, it was always this place that I would go to hide and to write, write for himself and hide in his house, because he didn't believe that he had any self-worth and that he could, so he wouldn't go out. Through Inside Out Weight Loss, John, um, lost 25 pounds total and has kept them off for three years so far. Um, his aha moment was realizing that he was worth, that he was actually worth something, that he was worthy of self-care. And so he began exercising and taking care of himself um, through the program. And um, that also gave him the courage, as you can see, 
to send off his, uh, those novels sitting in his room to the publisher. Um, I have one of them here. Now you know what the novel is. He sent it to me in, in gratitude. He said, this Inside Out Weight Loss gave me the courage to send this to the publisher. And today he has three novels published and a loyal and growing following. And this is a, a scene from Talistan. This is his attic, if you can believe it. <laughs> He's opened up his house and hosts all manner of events there, from murder mystery dinners to photo shoots, etc. So um, if you want to host an event at an amazing house in the UK, you can go to Talistan. <laughs> I'll introduce you to Amy. Amy is a 49-year-old mother, uh, partner in her own professional firm, and mother of two teenage boys. And like the others, her struggle began in her teen years when she started restricting her weight so that she could wear the you know, trendy jeans of the time and look fashionable. And that started a lifelong yo-yo cycle of dieting that she felt she would never, uh, never get out of. For her, the big issue, as for so many women, was putting everyone else's needs ahead of her own. As she began looking towards her retirement, she started realizing that if she didn't make some changes, she'd have some serious health and mobility issues. And so, unlike all of the other participants, she actually went on a medically supervised fast where she ate meal replacements and lost weight that way. But as she was finishing the fasting program, she realized that the maintenance program that, this, that they offered which involved counting calories and it was very traditional, was not going to be sustainable for her. And that's when she found Inside Out Weight Loss to teach her how to live as a naturally slender person. This is Amy today. She lost a total of 80 pounds and has maintained that weight for three years so far. And um, she has really learned to prioritize her own needs. Um, over others, prioritizing exercise and learning to really tune into her body. This is Susan. Excuse me for a moment. Susan is a 36 year old um, uh, working mother of two and also a devout Christian. And her childhood. Um, was extremely abnormal because she describes it as excellent and perfect. <laughs> she said it was wonderful, she was spoiled, she was loved, it was fantastic, and she was overweight, but so was her, were her other family members. And she didn't really think of her weight as a problem until she got into high school and the other kids let her know that it was a problem, that she didn't fit in. As a result of this, she started thinking, well, oh, I got better change. And the normal reaction, she started going on restrictive diets. These didn't work very well for her, and she gained even more weight, and eventually developed bulimia as an attempt, in an attempt to control her weight. Her turnaround point came in a surprising way. She, um, her father had a stroke, and as a result of the stroke, his brain was damaged in such a way that he could no longer tell a lie. Oh. So, her father was a very successful businessman, a leader in the Christian community in the church, um, a leader in the community, and he revealed that he had been having an affair for eight years with a close family friend. This was a huge betrayal for Susan, her family, and the entire community, and set her into a tailspin of depression and, weight, and even further weight gain. After a year of suffering like this, she knew she had to change, and that's when she discovered Inside Out weight loss. Susan lost a hundred pounds and has kept that off for, I believe it's four years so far. For Susan, a big, a huge piece of her recovery was um, coming to take ownership for herself and her life. Um, she started monitoring her own thoughts and she became hungry for the truth. And for her, truth was things that were um, Truth was things that were kind and compassionate for herself, and the lies in her thoughts were the cruel and harsh things which she would toss out. Um, through this process of really monitoring her thoughts and coming to learn what her own needs were, one of which was really spending time alone and renewing. And this bunny here, oops, oops. 
this bunny, mm. there we go, <laughs> literally fell into her window box one day <laughs> as a baby. <laughs> she finds it there and she says, oh, it's a gift from God. And this becomes her after work ritual every day, cuddling with oh. her beloved <laughs> bunny to the new. <laughs> All right. Uh, this is Stephanie. Stephanie is a 26-year-old French teacher whose weight struggle actually began in college. She had a roommate who had some hidden eating disorders, and they'd go to the school cafeteria together, and her roommate would get this little teeny tiny salad and say, oh, I'm not very hungry, or this is all I want, I'm so full. And then um, Stephanie would have this big plate of food, right? And she'd go, oh, you know, maybe there's something wrong with me. I better do something. At the same time, the university she went to is a place where there's a really strong fitness culture. So there's some serious recreational athletes there, triathletes, mountain climbers. And she, became, she joined in and became a uh, competitive ultimate frisbee player. So she's upping her exercise substantially and now trying to eat these little tiny salads which basically screwed her up around her weight, her relationship with food and her body. So then she started, her weight started yo-yoing, she started trying to diet, and really struggling with her weight. Eventually, she found Inside Out Weight Loss, and she lost 30 pounds, which she has maintained for two years. And interestingly, in Stephanie's case, when she, she lost the weight after college, and her exercise level went down substantially because she stopped competing in Ultimate Frisbee, and she got a job as a teacher. Between her first and second years of teaching, during that summer, at the end of the summer, she's trying on her clothes to go back to school, and um, she finds that they're all too big. The weight has just fallen off her, and she didn't realize it. And she goes, darn, I have to go buy new clothes. <laughs> I said, Stephanie, that is a really, really fine problem to have. <laughs> Wouldn't worry about that at all. <laughs> This is Belinda. Belinda is a 42-year-old single mother who works as an administrative assistant to local government. Belinda has struggled with her weight her entire life. When she was very young, actually, as a small child, she had cancer. And as part of her recovery, the, her family would say to her, you have to eat, you have to eat, you have to gain weight. So she learned that eating was a good health-sustaining thing. And then her mother, was always very overweight and always on a diet, kind of like my mother, always going up and down the scale, um, never having any success and really struggling. So Belinda reasoned, why should I bother? I love food. I'm not willing to give it up. There's no point in even trying to lose weight. And so she just resigned herself to her weight. But she had complications. She had type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, and high cholesterol. So one day, she's on a routine doctor's visit, accompanied by her 12-year-old daughter. They're in the doctor's office. The doctor walks in and says, Belinda, your blood sugar is out of control. We can no longer control it with the medication. It's not working anymore. Uh, your liver is dumping protein, and it's a life or death situation. She said, and the doctor said, I recommend bariatric surgery as soon as possible. As they're leaving the doctor's office, her 12-year-old daughter started, just broke down into sobs, saying, Mommy, you know, what can we do to help you? And that was Belinda's turnaround point. She realized that even though she didn't believe that she could lose weight, um, that she had to try something. So she found Inside Out Weight Loss. Belinda's aha moment was that she was worthy of love and self-care. Her alcoholic father had abandoned her as a young child, and she, um, as so many children do, figured it was her fault. There was something wrong with her. So she had to heal those wounds from her childhood. And as she was, she came to believe that she, too, was worthy of self-care. She barely changed her diet at all, but did begin exercising. Um, and she and her daughter ended up becoming fitness buddies and are now very active um, together. She lost 70 pounds and has maintained that weight loss for three and a half years so far. I should mention that in um, I should mention that all of these participants I got back in touch with because I conducted the interviews about a year ago, and 
um, I connected with them just to up getting, ask a few final questions and check in, and all of them had maintained their weight and were doing great um, even a year after our interviews. I was really delighted to hear. Because you, you know, it's always a little nerve-wracking there. <laughs> oh my God! <laughs> what if? All right. So let me share with you my findings. As I mentioned before, once I had finished the analysis of each of their stories, I was really curious to see if there was anything common among all of the participants. So I went back through each of their stories and I started making a list of every factor that had come up in every story. The list um, had over 40 different thing, tools and techniques on it. And I then went to determine, well, were there any that were common for everyone? And found that there were, in fact, six common factors that applied to each person. So I'd like to share those with you now. I should also note at this point that this no, in no way constitutes a definitive list. This is what happened to come up in the interviews. They could have forgotten to mention things. It could be a coincidence. Nevertheless, I offer this um, uh, for any insights that it might provide. The first common success factor I'd like to just talk about is releasing limiting beliefs. A limiting belief, well, let's talk about beliefs for a minute. A belief is something that we believe to be true, we hold to be true, independent of the evidence. So if I say I believe in God, it's not because I've read a scientific study that proves the existence of God. I'm not aware of anyone who has yet, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> but it's because I hold that belief to be true, just because. Similarly, political views are like that. We hold political views that aren't necessarily logic or reason-based. Because of this, Beliefs can be very difficult to change because if you engage in a logical argument with someone about, say, the God, the existence of God or politics, it's going to create a very heated debate because the, the beliefs are not going to yield to that logical discourse. The beliefs will continue to be held. So similarly, we hold beliefs about ourselves and who we are in the world that can limit us. So for example, um, John was a great example of this. He believed that he wasn't worthy of anything. He wasn't worthy. Um, in fact, I'll tell you a little story. He, um, one night he had an event in central London, and his parents lived nearby, so he was going to spend the night with them. He took the tube to their house, and as he, was, as he was walking from the tube station to their home, he fell and skinned his knee. So he arrives at his mother's door. You know, he's an executive at this point, but he arrives at his mother's door, and he's got this bloody knee. So his mother says, oh, my baby, let me help you, and rushes to dress the wound. He says, oh, she just loved it. <laughs> Whole thing about it. So she's dressing his, her baby's wound. And he says that in, that in that moment, he says it just all came out. All of his feelings that he had never been worthy of his mother's love, all of his feelings of inadequacy his entire life, he just spilled them out to his mother. And that was the beginning of his transformation, of coming to believe that in fact it wasn't true. He, what, he was worthy. And so what he says is once he had that hang on a moment, I'm worthy of something realization, it was all downhill, easy riding. Literally because cycling became his favorite. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I found particularly interesting in John's case is that once he released that belief, you know, here's a guy who's incredibly, incredibly prolific. He writes novels in his spare time, not one but three. He redoes his house in this extraordinary way. And he, you ask him, well, how do you write a novel? He says, oh, I just write a little bit every day, and pretty soon, you know, I've got a novel. But with his weight, he wasn't doing anything like that until he changed the belief. Once he changed this belief, he had this sudden idea, oh, I'll change 52 things in 52 weeks. So over the course of a year, each week, he changed one small thing about his lifestyle. And by the end of a year, he had overhauled, completely overhauled, his health and fitness lifestyle. While some beliefs can limit us, other beliefs can really empower us. And in particular, this belief is especially important. Believing in self-agency, self in other words, believing that you can change. 
You might remember in Belinda's case, she didn't think there was any point in trying because her mother had always tried to lose weight and never succeeded, so she believed she couldn't do it. With that kind of belief, you won't even make an attempt. So coming to this belief in self-agency was common for all six participants. Anne's case is particularly interesting. Oops, sorry. Um, one thing that's particularly interesting about this belief in self-agency is that it tends to, in the participants, it tended to generalize not just to the area of weight loss, but to other areas of their life. So Stephanie would say, oh, well, you know, I now believe that I can change my life in any area, and applied the techniques from the podcast to romantic relationships, as did Ellen. So they really gained a confidence about their ability to change anything in their life, not just their weight, through their experience. The third factor is tuning in to the body. The very notion of a diet says, okay, well, your body, left to your own devices, you're gonna overeat and be fat. I mean, look at you, really, right? <laughs> but if you follow my diet plan, then you'll, um, then you'll lose weight, right? So don't trust this, trust this other thing. The expertise lies outside of you, it is external to you. So at, over time, as you go on these diets and you start, you start to believe that, well, I can't trust my body. My body makes me fat, look at me, how else can I explain this? I have to trust this expert and that expert and this diet and that diet. And so we begin to tune out of our bodies. In Anne's case, she had said, you know, I really didn't have much awareness of what was happening from the neck down. Anne lost 80 pounds, right? But when she was 80 pounds overweight, she had no idea of the sensations. The, she didn't know what hunger felt like, what satiety felt like, what emotions felt like, because she was so tuned out of her body. So all six of the participants learned to tune in and reconnect with their bodies, to, um, which is a key principle in the Inside Out Weight Loss Program, to figure out, well, when am I hungry? When am I satisfied? And more importantly, which, how do different foods eaten at different times make my body feel over time? Does this, sit, does this sit well with me? Does this make me feel good? Does it give, it, give me energy? Or does it cause a, um, as Belinda said, you know, I, I ate a donut the other day and I realized that in half an hour I had a blood sugar crash and I was more hungry than when I started. Now I know the effect of a donut on my body. success factor is practicing self-compassion. One of the most common ways that the participants, and certainly me, try, have tried to motivate ourselves is by getting tough, right? <laughs> you lazy person, just get your butt into gear and do something, will you? Get some self-control. You know, make something happen. Um, discipline yourself. And so we try to criticize ourselves as a way to get ourselves into action. And this kind of get tough is popular on TV shows, like The Biggest Loser, for example. You know, just, just beat yourself into submission and get yourself going. What tends to happen when we criticize ourselves is what I call the cycle of overeating. Um, the self-criticism, oops, um, there we go. Self-criticism is very effective at making us feel bad. Right? You lazy idiot makes you feel really bad. And when we feel bad, what do we want to do? Well, nobody likes to feel bad. And so we want to start feeling good as quickly as possible. So it's not enough to say, oh, well, I'll feel good in a week when I've lost a couple pounds, in a month when I've lost more weight, in a year when I met, got my great you know, bikini body. I want to feel good right now because I feel crappy right now. So we think, well, what could make me feel good in this moment right now? <gasps> <laughs> and so, <laughs> so much easier. So we grab the cookie, we eat the cookie, and that makes us, that gives us a party in the mouth. Woo, great, this is so great, 30 seconds of bliss. And then, we start to feel crappy again. <laughs> Why did you do that, you idiot? You, I told you not to do that, now you're never gonna make any progress, you've already blown it. So we start the criticism, and the cycle continues again. Um, I'll just note here that limiting beliefs are like the perpetual generators of self-critical thoughts. When we hold beliefs about ourselves, like I'm not worthy, I'm an imposter, I'm no good, 
those beliefs will generate um, self-critical thoughts indefinitely. In contrast, we could have the cycle of self-compassion. When we speak kindly to ourselves, it causes us to feel pretty good. Hey, you know, that wasn't so bad. Anybody would have felt that way. No big deal. You know, that was really hard for you. Now we're feeling pretty good. Yeah, you know, yeah, not so bad. Yeah, okay. We feel good about ourselves. It makes us want to take care of ourselves. Just like if you have a bunny or a child or a pet who you love and you care of, you naturally want to meet that child's needs. You want to meet that creature's needs. When we love ourselves, we want to meet our own needs and take loving care of ourselves. As we take care of ourselves, it causes us, it reinforces this notion of being kind and loving to ourselves, creating this virtuous cycle of self-compassion. When you release limiting beliefs, uh, what tends to happen is you develop uh, unconditional self-acceptance. In other words, you start feeling good about yourself independent of judgment, just because you start feeling good about yourself. And that becomes like a generator, like an uh, uh, endless generator of self-compassionate thoughts. The fifth common success factor is viewing your weight loss as a journey. On traditional diets, there is the weight loss phase and there's the maintenance phase. And I can't, I have, we, uh, I have a friend who said he lost a, a bunch of weight, and he said to me, well, I'm really looking forward to reaching my goal weight because then I can relax. <laughs> <laughs> when we, um, which implies that there's some stress or control in the weight loss process. In contrast, each of the, par the participants found, viewed weight loss as a process, as an ongoing thing. Um, John said, um, he says, I'm not sitting around waiting for the bubble to burst. I really think that I've found a way that suits me to live. Showing that he is enjoying each day. He's eating and behaving in a healthy way because it is its own reward. And in this way, it's completely sustainable. And the final common success factor I'll share is immersing oneself in the program. Um, Stephanie said, I listened to the podcasts again and again because I really connected with certain podcasts. And John said, your voice has been in my life for years. When we finally spoke on the phone, he felt very familiar. <laughs> <laughs> um, also, each of them, interestingly enough, had this sense of time distortion. So they would, they'd clearly been listening for a long time and doing the work, but they said, yeah, all of a sudden, five pounds would be gone, or all of a sudden, I didn't care anymore. So this sense of time distortion suggests that they were really immersed in the program and again, viewing it as an ongoing journey or process. And now I'd like to look at the implications of my findings. When we look at the journeys that each of the participants uh, took, it's easy to see similarities with uh, spiritual practice. Like a spiritual practice, approaching weight loss as a journey makes it an ongoing process and a practice of awareness and connection. Susan likened this to a phrase from the Bible that she really connected with, which was keeping her thoughts captive, holding her thoughts captive. So for her, as I was mentioning before, that meant looking at her thoughts and saying, oh, well, is this true? In other words, is it kind? Or is it a lie? Is it harsh? Is it critical? And she tossed out the ones that she felt were critical. This, similarly, this process is very much like this awareness of your thoughts of what's going on inside of you is similar to the practice of mindfulness, which is a spiritual practice in its own right and also an integral part of self-compassion. Moreover, when we look deeply at the nature of the weight struggle, we find a series of cravings for more food than the body needs to be slim and healthy. So let's take a moment to look at the anatomy of a craving. <laughs> Say three o'clock in the afternoon rolls around and every day, like clockwork, you just, you just, you just 
want, you have this craving for a cookie. So before you know it, you're at the vending machine, you're at the snack bar, and you're grabbing that cookie because you need to pick me up. And no matter how much you try to bring in your celery sticks, they just don't <laughs> cut it. <laughs> you keep fantasizing about that cookie. It's like it's calling to you from the other room. So what's really causing this craving? Why can't a, uh, someone who's capable and responsible manage to control a little craving in the afternoon? Well, under, you might say, well, what caused it? Well, you know, I was kind of bored, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. I was a little bored, or my energy dipped, I, you know, and I just thought I'd a little pick-me-up. Very simple. But let's look underneath that. Boredom, I find, is a surface-level emotion. And when you look underneath boredom, you'll typically find something else, something deeper. So what could be going on at 3 o'clock in the afternoon? It could be, and these are things I've heard from my clients, it could be, you know, I haven't gotten as much work done today as I feel like I should have done, and I don't have a whole lot more time, and oh, God, I all this stuff to do. Or could be, you know, this job is so dull, and yet I feel trapped in it. I don't think anyone else would hire me. Or, you know, I'm not, I know I'm not doing a very good job, and they're going to figure out pretty soon, and they're gonna, I'm, they'll be fired any moment now. All of these kinds of worries can be going on beneath the surface. And so, who wants to deal with this kind of existential angst at 3 o'clock in the afternoon? It's much easier to just go eat the cookie. And so that's what we continue to do. So in, other, in order to really resolve that craving in a way that's going to last, we've got to resolve the underlying issue, the existential angst. And this is what I think Carl Jung was calling in, that last, in the quote on the last slide, that, that urging for, that desire for something greater. Than ourselves, that, that desire perhaps for, for wholeness. So if you look at, say you have this deeper fear, and it's called you have a limiting belief. You believe you're not worthy, that you're an imposter, you're soon going to be found out, and you release that limiting belief, right? You release the belief. So does that mean that then instead of believing you're not worthy, you now believe that you are worthy? Is there a one-for-one -one replacement? Well, it turns out that a lot of times what happens is that instead of coming to believe you're worthy, you start to question the whole notion of worthiness in a human being in the first place. So, well, who decides if I'm worthy? Well, what does it mean to be worthy as a human being? Do I have to re-earn this every day, or do I get like a 10-year pass on worthiness? <laughs> How does that work? And eventually you come to think, well, no, it's not that I'm unworthy, it's just that I am. And you develop this greater sense of connection, or perhaps you release some of the confines of the limiting self. And I think that that really is the desire or the experience of greater wholeness. And so beneath that craving, when we look deeper beneath this, the innocent craving for cookies at 3 p.m., if you really want to resolve that, you have to resolve the underlying issues, and you have to allow people ways that will help them connect with that greater sense of wholeness. So finally then, what is the key to lasting weight loss? Grapefruit for <laughs> breakfast. <laughs> These are available for sale on my website. <laughs> In all seriousness, these are the kinds of solutions that we're used to hearing about. This is what you get in the commercials and in the magazines. What Susan said was that when she was losing her 100 pounds, people would say to her, well, what's your secret? She said they really wanted to, to hear I was eating grapefruit for breakfast every day. And when she started getting into the deeper things, they didn't have a, a file folder for that. They didn't have a way of understanding that. It's tempting to think that there is a secret. So Stephanie said, oh, well, I started eating more protein and more fat, and then my cravings just went away. So you think, oh, that's it. More protein and fat in my diet, my cravings will disappear. Or John and Belinda increase their exercise, so that's it, I'll just exercise more. But then Alan and Stephanie struggled terribly with their weight at very high competitive levels of exercise. So that can't be the solution to the weight struggle. So what then is the solution if it's not at this level? I think the participant stories illustrate almost above anything else that the weight struggle is, um, is something that is much deeper than just a simple craving or uh, a simple lack of willpower or control. This is a struggle that they are feeling at the levels of 
mind, body, and spirit. It has psychological, it has spiritual, and it has physical elements. And so what we need then are solutions that address the physical, the psychological, and the spiritual. Well, this study is limited in scope um, and cannot therefore point to the definitive keys to lasting weight loss. It does offer some unconventional answers, suggestions, releasing limiting beliefs, believing in self-agency, tuning into our bodies, practicing self-compassion, viewing weight loss as a journey that's ongoing and immersing oneself in the transition. These common factors suggest that, again, a, an approach that addresses only one or even two of these aspects is never going to yield a truly holistic solution. We have a, an issue or problem that is across disciplines. It is, trans, it is interdisciplinary, and so we need interdisciplinary, even transdisciplinary, or integrative approaches, I think, I believe, if we're really going to create effective programs for long-term weight loss and the end of the weight struggle. Thank you very much. <laughs>
journey situation as a 20 years old that I remember this owning the parent inside mm -hmm. and yeah. saying, you know, basically no to the father yeah. or owning the mothering yeah. and so on. And, and, yeah. and, and how this came out, you know, inside the weight loss journey, but it was a deep psychological change yeah. as well. And, you know, so each one that speaks of limiting belief, that's a general category, it's a beautiful general category, but inside the narrative you have the beautiful uh, details that says, you know, what is it that people went through uh, mm -hmm. developmentally? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there's a, there's a strong consonance and resonance between the program itself, the transformative journey, and the narrative, the method that was able to show that mm -hmm. you know, as, it, as it stands out. Um, I, I don't have like big questions because it feels like to me uh, that each time that there was a question, you were like the person who was wanting to you know, right away, like, oh, oh okay. can you look over that stone and, and so on. And yeah. So you would think if she didn't present the long list of 40 factors, you know, so there's the six common factors, but there's all these other factors as well that, yeah. you, that you see. So there's a, they're really thorough. You're really, you've really been thorough in, 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 in doing the analyses. My uh, also uh, sense of the conclusion was that you have something very precious that you've been very generous to give yeah. outside and change, you know, the life of, you know, like in terms of uh, countless, uh, countless lives. Uh, then I'm thinking, you know, what's what? I'm always thinking, well, what's the next step for you in terms of taking this work out? In terms of the integrative approach, you know, where it can be, um, uh, you know, it, if there's such a big societal problem, and you really have something that it, that works, you know, you think this would be like a perfect match for mm -hmm. social. Yeah. So it may be bigger than a coaching yeah. practice in a mm -hmm. way. You know, mm -hmm. it feels like uh, where. Where is it in, in terms of social creativity that you see you know, taking this work? Yeah. You know? Well, as you were asking that question, I was hoping you were going to answer it too. You know, I don't exactly know. I'm sort of in the unfolding right now. Um, I have uh, dreams, and, um, but I'm trying to hold them very, very lightly. Um, and you know, be more grounded in the present because that's been a challenge for me mm -hmm. in the past. Um, so, um, you know, I the thing that I find it, that excites me about this is that the the, the cost of delivery of my podcast is almost nothing, right? And I had thought before I released the podcast that well, you know, my clients need to pay me because then they have skin in the game and then they'll actually pay attention and do it. But the popularity of the podcast disproved that. You know, it's completely free. No one requires them to uh, to listen to it. They do it all completely of their own volition. And so I find that incredibly inspiring that people, if you give them the tools, all right, if you, if you, and if you approach it in sort of a lighthearted or uh, in, in a way that assumes that it's, it's not that big a deal, right? I know these are big issues, but I mean, I remember when I had chronic fatigue and I struggled and struggled with it and I thought, um, you know, I'll never get better from this, and I couldn't go back to work, and it, I was trying to claw my way up the corporate ladder in the wrong industry, and um, at 100 miles an hour, and um, and I finally, I, I went to this, um, I had this reading with a, uh, like a fortune teller in Noe Valley, and uh, she said, oh, well, Renee, you, you have this fear of being a bad lady, and I'm like, I do, oh my god. <laughs> 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 I don't know why. And I said, but how am I going to change this? That could take like 10 years of therapy. And she just looked at me and she said, you know, Renee, healing can occur in an instant. And, and in that moment, my belief changed. And in that moment, I improved like 50% in my energy. So, so I'm really inspired by that. For me, personally, I, I don't know where it's going to take me. I would love to turn this into a book. My, my big dream is to have it be, Stephen, my husband, has pointed out to me that calling it a TV show is no longer appropriate. It could be a Netflix show, it could be a YouTube show. 
I'd like to have a, a popular show. Um, I would love to host a popular show with lots and lots of viewers where um, there is uh, there's sort of makeovers. So I would take a client, I would have uh, you know maybe 10 or so sessions that would all be filmed. It'd be edited for the, the most important things. Then there'd be um, like a, a nutrition or cooking segment and another expert could go and look at their you know, their dietary plan and we could do all different things with cooking and mm -hmm. um, you know cleaning out their pantries and what have you. And, um, and then there would be a, like a physical element and there could be like a physical fitness person that helps them find you know something that really suits them. You know what kind of activity do they like? How do they integrate that in their lives? And so we do this this um, this multi-dimensional makeover of people in an hour-long TV show, and we could have there'd be me working with people. We could also have other different types of disciplines, um, and so it'd be about sort of this psycho-spiritual transformation. So mm -hmm. that's. That is my vision and that is my dream, um, but I have no reason to believe that that, or no means to make that happen, so it's just kind of out there as a, as a dream. Yeah, in a way, it's, it's speaking to the fact that, oh, how can we present an integrative approach to the large, yeah. uh, uh, large population like this? Yeah. I, I, you know, <clears throat> this could be a fantastic way where you don't have the big word there that yeah. can put people off, yeah. Yeah. but you have the narrative part that kind of connects people heart to heart. Yes, so, right. so it would be almost like a, a, a non-dissertation yeah. uh, continuation of that methodology. Yes, that's right. Yeah. That kind of stories. becomes blended with, yeah. it's also the broadcast aspect yeah. that kind of speaks to the social change that can happen yeah. through example. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Wow, that's uh, you know this is this is a I, I've always been interested in kind of knowing what your next step is. Mm. So that, you know, however it is. That, yeah, you know, that, I don't know. I mean, you know, yeah. Monday I'll go and see clients and you know <laughs> <laughs> work on my website with Heather. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll see. Yeah. We'll see what it brings. I you know I'd like to maybe turn it into an article or two for a journal, maybe deliver a paper at a conference, mm -hmm. maybe get published. Congratulations again. That's mm -hmm. you know, really wonderful. Yeah. Well, I was really happy to get to chair your dissertation because for so many of us, including myself, family members, and so many friends and colleagues, food, the whole dietary process is just an ongoing Trauma. Mm -hmm. <laughs> trauma. Trauma. Yeah. Trauma. Yeah. Yeah. It's ongoing trauma. Yeah. And it's never relieved. Really, yeah. mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. really yeah. from it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's relentless. It's relentless. Yeah. So I've really in, in enjoyed your book and really looking at this physical, psychological, spiritual understanding really carefully all of the dialogues. I actually got a lot out of it, a lot of inspiration, personal mm -hmm. inspiration from it. Mm -hmm. And I also uh, listened to some of your podcasts and mm -hmm. passed them on to my sister. <laughs> <laughs> so very, um, it, it also, I, I think for personally, one thing that it did for me was bring home the fact that it's a lifestyle change. It's not about diet. It is. It has to be a lifestyle change or it's just a diet. Yeah. And then you go back. And, and so... That clicked on a very meaningful level for me, which I'm really grateful for. Yeah. Now, but I want to push the push it forward a little bit, or just get more information from you. In the meantime, I'd say over the last several months or so, I've been watching a lot of films and doing a lot of reading just on the addictive quality of processed food. Mm -hmm. The addictive quality, which is uh, very well thought out. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, yeah. scientists. Yeah. Yeah, they put a lot of smart people on it yeah. for a long yes. time. Yeah. And uh, so that addictive quality is something that needs to be dealt with, and people need to be trained and really need to understand. There's more literature. There's a lot of films on Netflix. Yes. Now coming out about that, I'm trying to actually watch all of them so yeah. I can become more and more educated. Um, you made that quote, a Jung's quote. Yeah. You know. Yeah. about uh, the addictive quality when alcohol itself is addictive. Yeah. 
food is addictive. Yeah. But food is addictive not just because of our self-soothing, mm -hmm. but because the food yes. is addictive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because of scientific you it's know, been designed to it's be been that way. It's been designed yes. to be addictive. Yeah. And so I'm wondering how you may be working with that or envisioning that or training your your clients to mm -hmm. deal with this addictive or mm -hmm. if you've thought about it or mm -hmm. just what's happening in your own mind with it. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've, I've certainly thought about it. I've experienced it myself as mm -hmm. well. Um, and the thing about food, you know, cocaine is also extremely addictive, but you can turn away from cocaine and never have it in your life again and all is well, right? Exactly. With food, it, it's there. Yeah. And, and so I think that that's the blessing and the curse. Clearly it's a curse because you can't just stop. But it's also a blessing because it forces us to take our transformation to a deeper level. Because we can't go into that black and white thinking, I'm either on food or off food. And that's kind of like the medical fast, right? I'm like, either you're on drugs or off drugs. With food, you have to be in relationship with it. You have no choice. And so it forces us to find that, I, I call it the gray scale between the black and the white. Um, and, and for that I'm grateful because I think that that is where the spiritual growth is. The other thing about food is that, you know, in a way, if you approach it in the way that I do, which is looking at cravings as being a, a greater yearning, right, that are just exaggerated by addictive foods, right? They just sort of, I mean, it's, it's my idea of what, what happens with PMS, right? Because, oh, at that time of the month, I just, you know, I can't do anything. I just have no self-control. Well, my feeling about the, that time of the month is it's just an amplifier. It amplifies what's already there. Yeah. And it's... And it does that, maybe, this is just you know in my head, maybe it, it happens that way from an evolutionary perspective because if we're getting ready to deliver another child, we better deal with our own crap, right? So it's gonna bring up those things that haven't yet been voiced, the annoyances, the whatever, maybe not in the nicest way, but they're under, they're, they're, the seeds to it are real. So in the same way, maybe these foods are amplifiers of the cravings that are already there, right? So they're, 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 they're taking it to a, they're just exaggerating the underlying issue that's already there. As you, um, as one comes to a greater level of self-care, you start to naturally desire to eat things that are good for you. So, so our son will say to me, "Oh, is that good for me, mommy?" And I'll say, "No." I say, oh, "I don't want that," right? Because he, he loves himself, right? He, he wants to take good care of himself. He, you know, he's a soccer player, and he can't. You know, he has to be as good as he can be on the field, and he, he truly desires to take care of himself. So that's where the knowledge piece comes in. Okay, well, I know that that is dangerous for me, and because I care about myself, I want to take good care of me, and I'm not going to go to McDonald's, therefore. I'm going to go to the farmer's market, right? I'm going to go and to the CIS cafe and get my brown rice and dal, right? Something that I know will sustain me in a, in a positive way. So. Um, it is absolutely true that these foods are, uh, they're powerful, they're very powerful. And so we should treat them with caution in the way that we treat cocaine and heroin and, and ecstasy and whatever else is the designer drug at the moment, and nicotine with caution. And that's my feeling. And the other piece, the final piece of it, just very quickly, is, um, is the ritual piece that's gone missing. What's happened with fast food is that the ritual has been stripped out of eating. Right? So the message of fast food is eat anything, anytime, anywhere that you feel like it. Well, traditionally, food has been surrounded by ritual since the beginning of time. People would come together, they would eat, they would sit down, they would share food. You do fast food, it's all gone. Well, if you think about drugs, I mean, look at um, entheogens, right? Those, when they're properly used and when they are incredibly, they can be incredibly transformative, it's when they're in the appropriate set and setting. It's when there is a sacred space that's created, an intention that's created around it. And then it can be a transformative journey, right, in the hands of a shaman. But you put it in, you know, as a street drug, and who knows what's going to happen, right? It could be very, very dangerous. So I feel like there's an important piece of ritual that needs to be reclaimed. And I feel like we need to um, understand that these foods are very, very dangerous, like other dangerous substances. So in, but in your presentation, in your podcast, is there yeah. an educative element? What I really encourage people to do again and again is to notice the effects of different foods on them. So if I eat a potato chip, I can tell that it's gonna give me a craving. I'm very sensitive to sugar. I know that if I have sugar today, I'll probably have a little craving tomorrow. 
And if I have sugar today and tomorrow, I'll probably have a bigger craving the third day. And if I have it for three days in a row, I'm definitely going to have a craving on the fourth day. So therefore, I treat it with caution. I know that if I make that choice today, I'm going to have to deal with it later. But all of this comes from coming back into the body and noticing how different foods affect you over time. And so that's what I encourage. I encourage them to um, move towards healthy, natural, non-processed foods. Um, and I don't say eat more protein or this or that because every body is different. And I encourage them, I, in fact, I, I, I do some installation of strategies, which is a neurolinguistic programming thing, to actually get them to um, automatically think to themselves, if I eat this, how will I feel in half an hour? How will I feel in an hour? And if you shift your time horizon from the party in the mouth to even a half an hour or an hour, your whole relationship with food will change. Yeah, that's what I was kind of wanting to hear from you, how much you're kind of integrating this educative element yeah. in, into it because, because of the tremendous power of addiction. Yeah. If you keep eating these type of foods, the, sometimes the intellect just gets wiped it out. It does. Oh, yeah. You know? And yeah. there you go. Yeah. <laughs> because there's no one inside to stop you. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I was also thinking that uh, there's a kind of a social dimension there. That this, I, in, in a way, you were speaking about that, the social almost uh, engineering of, of the craving and mm -hmm. so on. So it's, this kind of situates it within, within the person. Mm -hmm. But then there's also, yeah. maybe you can kind of like open and others think, well, there's a kind of there's social. There's a community element. Yeah, there's yeah. a community element. Yeah. And, and remember when we did the pilot, what came out was mm -hmm. also yes. as a factor that yeah. someone says, oh, I really like that because I feel like I'm in a relationship with you. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I can go to you yes. on the podcast. So yeah. your, the podcast then became mm -hmm. like. Internalized. Yeah, yeah. a relation, mm -hmm. like an internalized relationship yeah. that the person had. Yeah. And, then, and then if you see. <laughs> It seems like often the photos kind of brought people into changing their relationship with other people as well. Mm -hmm. So there's a social yes. dimension as well that, yeah. that, that is uh, taking that is taking place. Yes, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, and that's an important point. It doesn't didn't really come. I didn't sort of highlight it in, in this study, but it was very much true in the um, in the pilot. And if I look for it, I can think see it. You know, in John's case where mine became the voice in his head. I mean, I didn't, I didn't plan that, but that's what he's telling me that happened. So he's got that close connection. And then others are, you know, Stephanie was really connecting with her mother and then became a, a teacher to, and a role model for her, for her sister. And so there's that community element. And Belinda is now um, with her daughter, you know, make, doing the transformation with her daughter. They, um, they actually got rid of their t TV and her daughter Instead of watching TV, they go, they're active, where her daughter plays music. And now, as an 18 year old or however old she is, you know, music is her life, and she plays in several bands. Mm -hmm. So I find that really kind of a ripple effect. Uh, uh, the, yeah, yeah, and I, I do yeah. talk about the ripple effect and the benefits, but, and I'm sure that there is another place for a, um, you know, a, a, the role of community and, and peer pressure. Because mm -hmm. we certainly saw the negative role of peer pressure, yeah. right? You know, when someone says, you can fit into a slim, or, yeah, yeah. or you know, Susan's <laughs> friends say, you're fat, you know, and, and this causes the problem. So similarly, you know, you could reverse that. And let's do this together, part. let's yes. do this program together, and yeah. there's a kind of, like, something that's yes. take, that is taking place yeah. around the common purpose. Yes. Yeah. So my online classes, and Heather is, and I are creating a new website with a big forum, we find that the forum, the sharing between, among the community members is actually turned into a, a huge piece mm -hmm. of, their, of their recovery. Yeah. Yeah. If you could actually have your video show on, the, <coughs> on your website, mm. and then now they're starting to, have you read about what they're doing with YouTube? They're starting, they're starting their own shows, yeah. They're starting their own shows. I mean, eventually you could just spread out and whatever way you want to. Yeah, well, I was just reading that Netflix is doing that, and they've got as many subscribers as HBO now, yeah. and they're doing their own shows. I said, oh, yeah. wow, well, you know, <laughs> it could be a Netflix show. <laughs> I forget the name of it. Yeah. The one is extremely popular, when that one that's just come on the very rich crowd of people. What was that? Yeah. House of Cards? Yeah, yeah. yeah. House, yeah. House of Cards yeah. on Netflix. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 
It's really, it's very, very popular. Yeah. <laughs> well, in the sense that you have kind of rid, rid uh, you, you rode the social network by mm -hmm. giving this free. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I mean, I mean, it's not so so much social network as the iTunes, you know, like the, the openness yeah. that the yeah. the yeah. delivery program. Before yes. you couldn't broadcast like Could that. Could not do it, no. You know, unless you were ABC or whatnot. Yeah. And then suddenly, you know, anyone can, yeah. you know, with yeah. good content, yeah. can attract people yeah. because they relate to the content, yeah. you know, not because you're a big box. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and so, why not? You yeah. know, why not then continue that, yeah. that uh, writing, uh, writing this? Yeah. I mean, it feels like uh, it all because you already can show that there was a success in that first wave of it. Yeah. It's already there. Yeah. I mean, it's not as if you come in cold. And no, it's, it's not. You know? It's not. So it's not. You have a dissertation. You have the credential. You have all of you know all of that. So, yeah, I haven't yeah. quite. I haven't gone there yet, but I think uh, I, I'm hoping. Oh well, that's right. It's few minutes left. Maybe in a year and now. No. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, well, you, uh, who's going to challenge, cha challenge uh, ch channel the, the external member? I'm sorry. That, uh, she, she I know, well, she's just a complainer. But she did uh, uh, present uh, some feedback. She did yes, she, some she feedback. provided some written yeah. feedback, yeah, on the, yeah. on the dissertation itself. I imagine something unforeseen happened because yeah. she's been completely offline today, so something yeah. must have happened. Maybe she cannot be reached on this. Where is she at? She's at Noetic Science uh, here? She's or? doing a workshop at IONS this weekend. Okay. But I thought she was in the East Bay. Yeah. But then she said her plans changed or something came up. So I don't have any details of what, yeah. if what she's actually up? in California or in Texas or. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, but she was for yeah. hours screwed up if she's in. Yeah. Her <laughs> original concern was that. It was stories of success only. Yeah. So therefore, you don't know how to improve That's right. the program yeah. if you don't know really what, uh, you know. But, I mean, do you have any idea of how you can improve the podcast, even from what you've seen? Um, you know, or, you know, how even I, how the story of the success, you know? How I can improve the podcast itself? Yeah. Um, if well, you I were was, to continue it, you know. Yeah, well, I do, I do plan to continue it now that um, yeah. a big piece of work is <laughs> it seems to be completed, almost. Um, um, I think just, you know, continuing to work on my delivery, every time I listen, I'm like, oh, you know, you should be smoother there, or do this, that, or... Um, I, I don't know, I mean, I feel like I... Um, and, and then it's been sort of a natural evolution. The first few episodes I scripted, and then I just got into this flow state, and then I would have a, I had an outline, and then I would just have a, a topic idea, and then before you know it, the whole thing was just kind of, I just sit there, and I didn't, you know, I'd be like, oh, wow, that was interesting, I don't know. <laughs> so I enjoy that process a lot. I, it's, um, I really enjoy it, and I seem to have no idea what the better podcasts are, because I'm like, oh, man, I really, uh, and then people are like, that was the best one, you know, so, um, <laughs> I don't know. I, I you know I think that I want to. I just want to continue to take the, the topics that come up and connect with my listeners. I've got a new website that's interactive with walking through my you know, with interactive tools, walking people through the program. So that's a big area of development. Um, and then um, I will, um, you know, then uh, you know, video would be a lot of fun to do. So <laughs> if that presents itself, then I would be delighted. I'd be very excited. Well, maybe this is a good time to open it up. Uh, That's what I was thinking. Um, can I sit down now? <laughs> 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 so I'd like to just... Our, uh, talking will be going out of the Okay. I'd like okay. to congratulate you and um, say, yeah, you could totally have a TV show. Mm -hmm. Totally, I could see you. Because there's something about you that bridges <laughs> the world, the sort of mainstream world and the alternative. <coughs> it seems like you walk in both worlds. Mm -hmm. um, I'd be really curious to see if um, something that might come out of this for you would be looking at how this could be converted into an educational tool mm -hmm. on the much younger age. Mm -hmm. um, like how do we prevent that 
yeah. that peer pressure from happening? How yeah. do we how do we educate children from knowing what's going on with themselves? And yeah. how 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 would we go on that level of you know educating kids so that they don't, they're not being fed? I mean, we can't stop you know what's being fed from their parents. Yeah. But I'd be so curious if there's something that would emerge from your work that would address prevention yeah. rather than, tr you know, like, yeah. not that it's treatment, but you're dealing with the wounds yeah. of, you know, human suffering. Yeah. Yeah. But I would love to know how it would inform the preventive layers yeah. uh, of the psyche. Like, how could we prevent the trauma from yeah. happening in the first place? Yeah. You know, I mean, of course, the parents, society, advertisements, you know, Danielle's office always overlooks this where he used to be this huge billboard and it's always an advertisement for alcohol and and vodka. Vodka. <laughs> right? yeah, most often that alcohol advertisement has something to do with a woman's body yes you know, that sexy kind of perfect shape so I'd love to see how you know this would transform um, like become a virus mm -hmm. in our society so that we could heal you know from yeah. the very we could heal those root Problems, yeah. Causes. Yeah. I. I've seed over there. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I. You know. I. 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 really don't know. Um, I. You know. I, I. I don't know. I. I do think that teaching children to really pay attention to their bodies and to trust their bodies, because I do think that so much of what happens, even in nutrition education, is here's the food pyramid. Right. Do this and do that and do this. Right. Well. Yeah, but then it turns out, well, the food pyramid might not be such a good idea because, you know. And the expertise is always then within our own bodies. Mm -hmm. And nothing really substitutes for, for that. Oh. <laughs> We just finished the presentation. <laughs> so, so I thought it was, I don't know what happened, I thought it was brief, um, and I didn't have my cell phone near me. Um, what can I do? Can I do anything at this point? Um, five minutes. Kristen, this is Carol Whitfield. I'm chair of Renee's dissertation, and Danielle Delorier is here. Um, we both questioned Renee for maybe 10, 15 minutes after her presentation. Okay. You might want to spend just a few minutes with Renee, just asking her some questions that you're interested in, just so that you can have a voice uh, in this yeah. process. We've got about you, we've got about 20 minutes um, okay. left. Why don't you take can a few I call minutes? Can the conference line? That you're, you're on it. You're on it. Oh, I'm on it. Okay. You're on it. Oh, man. And they, I'm, they, just kind of, I'm in California, and I'm off of different times of, I don't know, I've had three in my head, and then, oh, well, I'm really sorry, Renee. Well, if it makes you feel better, Kristen, I had it um, in my head that the presentation started at noon today when it was actually one, so I should have been an hour and a half early. <laughs> and I was saying, oh, well, thank God I didn't mix it up the other way, so I'm very sympathetic. <laughs> oh, sorry. I'm my fault, but at least, uh, at least I can go ahead and put my, put my presence down, even late. Yeah, okay, and, and so, we, did, um, we did videotape the presentation, too, so there's, there's a video. Okay. Yeah. Well, then also, I mean, I read your dissertation when Early, like, and I had, you know, hardly any comments. I thought it was so good, so you know, I certainly don't have any concerns. Um, you know, I kind of, I gave you a lot of feedback earlier. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, well, so your presentation. I mean, I assume that it's basically just summing up what the study was, right? So. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I, uh, Carol had advised me to just focus in on the juicy bits so um, and the anecdotes so that's what I I tried to do um, right. and um, but you know it's it's based on it's based on the, the dissertation so there's no new material there it's more of an right. abbreviation yeah. of what's what's in the yeah. dissertation yeah. yeah and I just read it in the second version like really recently so it's all fresh yeah. so um, um, yeah so in terms of what to ask you I guess I don't I don't know if I have anything to address my sisters. My biggest concern to address is just making really, really clear that it's perceptions that you can't, 
use any language whatsoever that kind of says what it says. Any causality, but you did. They did a great job of that. Thank you. And then um, I still want to see when you change the um, uh, neural linguistic programming because I still want to know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> I still don't understand. It's like this one put a computer chip in your head. And like, <laughs> <laughs> that was the one thing I felt. Just, so that's the time rule definition. And um, I love the intervention. Like I say, tell everyone to buy your book. All my friends can say, I want to lose weight. I say, buy this book. <laughs> Thank you. It's really, it's just so good. Uh, yeah, I'm just trying to think of any questions for you. Um, well, you know, I can tell you about neurolinguistic programming while you're thinking. Um, okay. And, and thank you for pushing me on that because it, it's that's been a, a tough one for me to define. Um, I haven't written a new definition for the dissertation yet, but I will this week. Um, and what I, what I described it in the presentation as um, a set of tools and techniques to create rapid psychological change for personal development and growth. So. Right, but see, the thing is that's so vague. I mean, that could be like eat three M&Ms and their tools to define. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like this, something more specific of what type of technique. So that's what I'm wondering. Was it like DFT where you're tapping on the meridians? Memorized phrases? Are you taking a hot shower while visualizing your guru? I mean, there's like so many things that that could mean, and that's what I was really unclear about. Sure. Yeah. So, um, NLP does include a, a, a quite a variety of techniques. A lot of them are language based. So, for example, if you have um, a, um, uh, if you have, sorry, my daughter keeps calling me. Um, if you have a, uh, <laughs> um, uh, a belief that I'm I'm not worthy, an NLP what NLP would say is, well, start questioning that belief. Don't just deny it, but say, well, how do you know you're not worthy, or according to whom are you not worthy? So that might be one technique would be the questioning. Another one would be behavioral piece, right? Yes, that's right. Okay. Another technique would be um, taking very uh, literally the. Um, the metaphors and gestures that a person uses. So, for example, if someone is describing a problem and they're saying, oh, it's like a, uh, I feel really overwhelmed, and then they take their hands and they kind of, you know, are sweeping them over the head, then you can imagine that in the internal representation system, they are experiencing maybe something like a, a, a tidal wave over their head, some kind of, mm -hmm. right? So you take the metaphor that they're using that is expressed in their language and in their gestures, you notice that and then you would use that to help them change their experience. So you might say, yes, um, you know, um, so you feel, you know, kind of overwhelmed. Well, you know, what would it be like if, I, now, now I'm getting myself into having to solve this I, I person's <laughs> issue, but. <laughs> you had a boat or something like Yeah, what if you had a boat, what if, what if you were surfing, you know? What if it were like yeah. surfing, right? So you might say something like that. Um, there are other um, uh, uh, language pieces that, that involve focusing on um, the solution state. So if someone, you know, it's very common, someone will come in and, and tell you all the problems that they have, and they've never really stopped to think, well, what would be better? You know, oh, it's so terrible because, you know, my, my uh, husband says this, and then I don't have the energy, and da -da -da, and they go on about their problem, and you say, well, what would you like instead? So NLP says we'll focus on the solution state rather than the problem state, and just that shift will help you begin to think of, of ways that you could get to your solution state. So those are some examples of, of, of NLP approaches that one might use, and a lot of them at this point are, in, are, um, are you find in various psychotherapeutic techniques. It's just right. that it pulls them out. The difference between psychotherapy, I think, and NLP is that psychotherapy tends to be more process oriented. NLP is always very outcome oriented. So let's figure out what you want and then let's figure out how to get that for you. So it's, it's about the shortest path to creating the result that someone wants. Okay, well and I think those definitions are in there. What was lacking was the examples. Ah, so okay. Say, Here's two examples of how it might focus on language. Here's two examples of how it might use imagery or one example. You know, I think, again, your definition is fine as long as we can tie it to something concrete. Mm, okay. So, um, yeah, uh, 
I didn't know that, so now I know. Yeah, that's good feedback. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Talked about future research directions, not talked about that. So, you know, I suppose I don't really have any other comments that I can think of that you haven't already addressed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Christine, this is Daniel Delaoye. Uh, hi to, to you, and good to talk to you uh, again. This is the first time we speak since the uh, dissertation uh, proposal meeting. And uh, yeah, we were, we, all of us were like you in a way, uh, you know, the, the dissertation feels very complete, feels like it, it uh, addresses all the, the problem, you know, present the methodology very, uh, um, uh, very clearly and, and very thoroughly and uh, the analysis were, were, you know, extremely well done and, and succinct at the same time and, and uh, so, so yeah, we, we found ourselves to be uh, more into uh, the complementary <laughs> kind of position. So that's a good place to be uh, as a committee, you know, as opposed to a long list of things to address. <laughs> <laughs> so. Well, I must say I kind of like the, the, um, the idea of having something that you can do for your position. Yeah. <laughs> makes a lot more sense. Yeah. You have the time to fix them. Kristen, I have a question for you, if I might. Um, my um, part of my, I guess, journey has been um, kind of merging a, a conventional world with um, the more spiritual side of things, and I'm now I'm, you know, wondering how I might, um, you know, how, how I might take this kind of research and, you know, maybe get it published in an academic journal or presented at a conference. I, I don't quite know where to go from here and um, I'm, you know, you've been quite successful with self-compassion so I'm wondering if you have any advice along those lines. Um, you know, the, the problem is if any of the journals have I publish in when it's published them because um, it's qualitative. It's qualitative, but there are qualitative journals. Yeah, yeah. There are quite a number. Yeah. Um, I'm, so, so I'm just not familiar with those. I'm familiar more with the, you know, more empirical where you have data. Now I know, um, and you do have a coding system, so I, I'm just not the best person to tell you. I'm sure there are some qualitative journals out there. Again, the slight, well, no, I guess that's okay. The slight issue which you're going to have to be careful about is you looked at people who have success stories. So it can't really be presented as an investigation, mm -hmm. as any sort of like empirical investigation of anything. It's more really just finding out if these people what work for them. Mm -hmm. And which is totally another valid way to do it. You just have to be careful you aren't framed as framing it as an empirical investigation of anything so much. Mm -hmm. But I you know, I would just talk to you just quality to research. I just I don't really even know where to begin with that because it's very from what I do. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I mean, I think probably the popular issue would be very good place. For so the, pop, the popular? Yeah. It's more of the popular media. I mean, it depends if you want it in an academic journal. But I don't, you know, it, it seems to me what strikes me about this work is it's, it's really more about finding something that helps people. And it's much more applied and pragmatic. It's not trying to necessarily build a particular theory, I mean, obviously there's a theoretical orientation, but at least the way it strikes me is it's, it's really defined to find something that's actually to help people. That's, that's right. You know? That's exactly right. So, if, you know, I don't know if it, it, you have to decide how important is it for you to publish in a peer-reviewed academic journal. Like, you already have your book. Yeah. It's nice to have some, um, you know, something like a dissertation supporting it, but... Yeah, I don't know what to say. Talk to somebody who does qualitative research, but just ask yourself, how important is it for me to do that? Or do I want to just get out there and keep doing the work, and is that really ultimately what's going to be most important for me? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think it is. It's just, I, um, I, I figure academic would would give me more credibility, but may, you know, maybe it's not necessary, because my, my calling is more to just get out there and help people. 
No, I mean, again, do you know anyone who publishes some qualitative journals? Yeah. I probably do. It's probably a lot of people. I just, I just don't. Yeah. So, um, but yeah. you look at Brene Brown, man. She's on Oprah, and she hasn't published in a single peer review journal. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Oh, that's impressive. Mm -hmm. That makes me feel yeah, good. They, it's funny. They call her a researcher. She has just done some qualitative research that she put in a book, but I don't think she's published in a single peer review journal. Really? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so it's not for Dave Brown getting an Oprah. It's not because it's not for you. Oh, well, I'm, I'm, that's inspiring. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All of the Brown models. All I can say is she's doing pretty well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Plus, her name is similar to mine, so that's got to be a good sign. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Perfect. Kristen? This is Carol yep. Whitfield calling from Hi, Talking Karen. to Hi. Uh, we're thinking about, we were going to step out, but now that you are on a conference call, I was thinking, no, that maybe that we can just have this discussion here. I think because all three of us are so positive about the, about uh, Renee's work, um, there are some yeah. things I just wanted to ask you about. There were a couple of things that you still, some corrections or some additions that you wanted her to make on the NLP, and I could list those at, uh, on the form that we fill out here. Yeah, well, it's, uh, the form I filled out, I, I went ahead, I didn't list it as I accepted it. If those changes are made, because I think if she didn't make them, it would still be acceptable. It's just that I think it would be stronger if she did that. Um, but like, my approval isn't contingent on her doing that. It's just, kind of do it both ways. It's more just, I think, would be nice. I see. So it's up to her to kind of work that out with you and to yeah, make like those changes if, if she decides. Yeah. <laughs> so that's what I would say. Yeah. Well, yeah. Renee, you told yeah, me that, that, that... I don't feel a need for us to talk privately. When it's all clear, we're all, yeah. No, <laughs> no because we're all so supportive. Yeah. Uh, one thing, though, is that you still have to integrate some of Danielle's... Yeah, I haven't things. yet put... I've discussed them with him, but I haven't yet integrated them. And so, but those are on the docket to be done? This week, yeah. Okay. yeah. And with uh, Kristen's, I think that her... I'll do that at the same time. With NL I'll put the NLP examples in at the same time that I put, that I do I integrate Danielle's comments. Yeah. Great, so what, what I would say is once these are done, mm -hmm. then we'll do a final signature. Okay. How do you feel about that? Yeah, I can put mine right there so the... the Everything the, will be signed. Yeah, will And be I'll signed. just put my final signature. Yeah. Once yeah. you've made these changes that I'll list on here, it would be yeah. perfect. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. And I think the signature form I sent in, that should do, shouldn't it? Yes, Some you're fine. It again, great. It's just a... As chair, I give that final signature, and I'll just wait until these things are integrated and Renee turns in her final dissertation, and then I'll sign off on will be done. Okay. Does that seem all right with yeah. you? Does Kristen need to watch the presentation or no? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. No. Okay. okay. But though we're going to send it to her so, so okay. she can. Her okay. presentation was absolutely excellent. You'll love it. So we'll okay. be sending you a link so that you'll be able to watch it on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> I've been traveling so much. It's just, I think the start was a little, but I think I'm going to have to pull back. <laughs> <laughs> Self-compassion, yes. Yeah. That's self-compassion. Time for self-compassion. Was it was it scheduled at three o'clock at one point and then got No, no, it was one to three. One to three. So it was one to three. And somehow I heard it. Um, I don't know. I've I've been doing a few things like that lately with the sign that I've been traveling too much. Well, I would like to I would like to end this discussion by congratulating Renee. Yeah, so much. yeah. This is <laughs> I would like to welcome you into this illustrious group of doctors. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, Dr. Stevens. Congratulations. <laughs> 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 Dr. Stevens. Congratulations. <laughs> 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 creating something.